Welcome to Rivers United Church Online. My name is John Hunter. I'm one of the co-lead pastors of Rivers United Church. I want to welcome you to our online church experience. Today we're continuing a series called Running with the Giants, in which we've been taking a look at some ordinary people that did extraordinary things with their life, but the reason they were able to do that is because they had faith in God. And so we've been taking a look at some principles from their life that applies to our life today. And today we have an incredible story from the Bible. When I say story, I mean it's a historical account, but it's an amazing story about some people's lives that did some extraordinary things in some very, very difficult times. And I think it will apply for us. But here's what I want you to do. As you th- before we get to this story, I want you to ask yourself this question. What would a person like me do if I really trusted in God? Now, now when I say that, what I mean is in the circumstances that you're in right now. Not the circumstances that we want or we wished for, but some of us, we've had our life turn in ways that we go, I didn't think this is how my life would go, but here it is. And so what would I do? What would I do right now in the circumstances that I'm in if I really trusted in God? Maybe your life is going well, and I want you to still ask the same question. So in that lens, we're going to look at a person's life that an entire book of the Bible is named after. And she is one person that you would never think that a book of the Bible would be named after her. And she comes in a kind of an obscure place between the time of the judges in the Old Testament and the time of the kings falls this story. And so let me kind of just set it up for you just a little bit. In the history of the nation of Israel, uh, one of the big times for them was when they were able to leave Egypt. They were slaves, and God raised a deliverer named Moses to come and deliver them out of the land of Egypt. And they had been slaves for over 400 years, and so Moses takes them from Egypt to the promised land. That's the greatest exodus in the history of mankind. It's found in the book of Exodus. You can look at that for yourself. And when they got there, uh, the next leader came and, and brought them into the promised land, and his name was Joshua. And Joshua brought them in, and God gave him a command that seemed to be almost like, really? I mean, like, I can't believe a loving God would do this. But, but it's very important to the story we have today, and I think it's important to the story in our own personal stories about why God did this. So when God brought them in, he said, hey, I want you to utterly destroy and, and, and don't have relationship with the people that are currently there. Because over the 400 years they were in Egypt, these people had come and been in the, in the place that was promised to Abraham. It wasn't just because God was a racist. It was because of the things that these people had done. They had become so horrible. I'll just give you one example. One of the things that they had done was they would offer their babies and and throw them into the fire to worship their horrible gods. That's just one of the things that they did during those times. And so God said, I don't want you guys to be like them, so separate yourself from them. And they were called, in in my opinion, they were called the ites. They all had ites at the end of their name. They were Canaanites, and they were uh, Hittites, and there were Amorites, and there were Melabites. And so it wasn't cool to be an ite when, when you come. And, and we'll get more into that in a minute because it has everything to do with the story we're going to have today. So after they got in, uh, th- things went prosperous for them. They worshiped God. They actually followed God. And they did exactly what God said when they came as slaves. And, and then they became prosperous and they lived there for a while. And after a few generations, they became very prosperous because God had really blessed them. Uh, God had really blessed their lives. But then... As they became prosperous, they did what a lot of us do. They became apathetic. They became where they decided that, hey, they weren't as grateful for what God had done. And they started to say, hey, we did this. And later on, they started to say, hey, does it really matter if we intermarry with the ites? And they did. And then what happens is, is then they would start to worship the other gods that were in their land. And, uh, and so instead of worshiping the true God, they would worship uh, the other gods and stuff like that. And so then what would happen is the blessing of God came off of them. And other nations would rise up, and then they would come and beat them up or take them as slaves. And then, and then in their humility, they would cry out to God and say, God, please deliver us. And God would raise up a deliverer, and they called them a judge. And that's really where this story comes. And they repeated that cycle for hundreds of years. And right in the middle of the time of the judges comes a story that links the time of the judges to the time of the kings of Israel. 
and it's found here in this story. So let me just tell you about this family, okay? Because in the book of uh, Judges, it's like a historical narrative, and you're following a chronological order, and then all of a sudden you get to a book that's just about a family's life. So let me tell you a little bit about this family. And the family that I want to tell you about today, they came from Israel when Israel was having a famine, and they were going through a hard time and didn't have enough food. And so they knew that they needed to stay in Israel, but they didn't quite have enough faith. And so what they decided to do is, is I know what God says, but we're going to leave Israel and go to Moab. And in Moab, they have Moabites. And God said, don't do that. Remember I said, I, he said, don't go there. But they decided to do that. You ever done that in your life? Where it's like, hey man, I know what the right thing is to do. I know what it is that God says to do but it's really kind of hard, and so you kind of justify it and say, well, yeah, I know what God says, but if you ever find yourself there, that's a really tough place to be, and I'll challenge you with that today. I've done that many times in my life. One of the things that I struggled with the most in my life was my finance, that I would always try to get out of debt, but then when I did and and I started to get a little bit of money or I got credit and stuff, I would just go out and spend and spend and spend, and I knew that wasn't what God wanted. And then in order to get out of debt, then I would get more debt and more debt, and it never helped. And I think that's exactly kind of the place they found their self at was, was doing that. And so they go there to make their life better. And it ends up being that their boys, they, they had two boys. It was a man and a woman. And, and the mother's name was Naomi. And we're going to focus on her a little bit today. And she had, they had two sons. And, and they went there to get prosperous. And then right in the middle of being there to try to make more money, both the husband and the boys died. <laughs> and it left Naomi with two daughter-in-laws. And she's like, you know, things went from bad to worse, right? Hey, we thought we were going to go here, and even though we weren't doing what God said, we were trying to make it better, and now life has went from bad to worse. What do you do when life goes from bad to worse? I have a feeling somebody, that's where you're at today. That's where I've been at in my life. What do you do when things go from bad to worse? So she told her daughter-in-law, she said, hey, here's what I want you to do. Go back to Moab. I'm going to go back to Israel but I want you guys to stay in Moab. I got family there, and they'll take care of me. But here's the problem. You have no idea. You're an ite, right? You're a Moabite. And the problem is this. You, you have no idea what it would be like to be a Moabite in a Jewish world. You, you don't want to come back with me, okay? So go back. And one of the daughter in law said, I love you, Naomi. But she went back to be with her family. But one of the daughter in laws looked at her, and she said, Mother-in-law, you're one of the most godly women I've ever met. You're, you're a mother to me. And I, you have introduced me to your God. And even though maybe you did the wrong thing by coming to Moab, you let me know who the true God is. And I don't want to change that. So here's what I want to do. And I'll show you this in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16. This is the daughter-in-law, Ruth. She said, but Ruth replied, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back to, from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. For some of us, we know that from a praise song that we sing. If you, if you come to our services, sometimes we sing this. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. That's where we get that song. You might not have known that, but I just wanted to make sure uh, you know that. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. In that moment, these two ladies made a decision. They said, hey, look, I don't know what the future holds. I know that it's going to be tough being a Moabite in a Jewish world. In fact, hey, when I sent out my Christmas card or my Hanukkah letter, whatever they sent back then, she realized, hey, you know, I didn't include this. I just said, hey, we're traveling, and now they're going to know. But but it wasn't just about that. It was about saying, hey, Naomi, I think this is going to be difficult. But after she said that, they decided together, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to trust in God. And it brings me to the first place that I go, the most, some of the most vulnerable times of our life. Can I tell you when it is? When things go from bad to worse. And they made a decision here to do something that I don't, I haven't always made this decision in my life, but it's a, it's a great example of what to do and what not to do. And it's this, they could have chose to do this. They could have chose to place blame instead of trust God. And my challenge to you today is this, is number one. When life goes from bad to worse, don't blame. Instead, trust God. (laughs) That might seem small, but when you're in it, and somebody, I have a feeling you're watching and you're going, yeah, my life has went from bad to worse, and I know exactly what you're talking about, right? Or you have an offense, somebody did something to you, and it's made your life really, really difficult, or it's been really hurtful, or it's a past thing that you just can't get over. The number one weapon that Satan uses against us, can I tell you what it is? It's offense. 
It's blaming. It's going, hey, when we go through hard times, instead of saying, hey, let's put our faith and trust in God and trust him with an unknown future, we go, you know what we're going to do? We're going to blame somebody. Maybe we're blaming God himself. And so what I would recommend is this, is that we don't blame, we trust God. Now, let me, let me tell you a little bit about how to, how to do that. Let me give you an exercise that I've done that kind of helps me, right? And, and you'll know if you struggle with this. So here's my question. Do you, do you ever, if, if somebody ever mentioned a name of a person and you find yourself seething even after an hour after they've mentioned that person's name? <laughs> or you're driving along in your car and you're having an imaginary conversation and you're winning the argument? If that's you, then you need to lean into this. You, you, have, a, you have a resentment that you need to let go of. And I'm going to tell you a, a, a methodology that's kind of helped me in my life, and that's this, that, that maybe visualize it like this, to take whatever that is, whatever that target is, that you go, hey, man, I'm struggling letting go of this thing. And, and act like, hey, man, just visualize in your head that you're driving in a car and you're viewing it like you would if you were driving down the road and you kind of saw an accident and you look at the incident. And what I want you to do is, is take a notebook and write down the things that happened. Hey, that person did this to me. That person did that to me. Or you might see some things that you go, hey, I wasn't right here. Hey, I was at fault here. I did this. And then I want you to drive back through again. And the second time what you want to do is this, is wherever you see that somebody did you wrong, forgive them. Now, this might take more than one time because it's not an easy thing to do, but forgive them. Don't, don't keep holding on to that blame. It, the second thing is, is where you see that you made mistakes. Yeah, I have a feeling Naomi might have been in that category. Hey, we moved here, and I'm the one that made the mistake. And here's what I would recommend. Forgive yourself, because here's what I know. You can't continue to blame and trust God at the same time. These two ladies made a decision this day that what happened there between the two of them changed the course of not only their lives, but the world. And we'll tell you all about how that, that occurred, okay? So let's keep going in the story. So number one, don't blame, instead trust God. So we're going to go forward in the story, and we're going to skip down to Ruth chapter 3 and verse 18. So let me just kind of tell you how the story goes. So they go back to Israel. Now the problem is this, is that even though that Naomi and her husband and her boys moved to um, Moab to get wealthy, and, and they thought that there would be a time that they could get wealthier there, they didn't get wealthy there. What ended up happening to them is she didn't have, she was actually poor when she came back to Israel. So Ruth, when they came back, said, hey, you're getting older, Naomi. I will go back to work. And she said, hey, Naomi told her, she's like, hey, here's what you do. You go out and you go to these farms. And what they'll do is, is after they go through the grain, after they go through and reap the grain, they'll allow you to go back through and glean the fields and you can bring grain home and we can live off of that, that grain. It's just one of the ways that we take care of people in Israel. And so she said, but don't go to these places because, you know, you're a young, beautiful woman. They'll take advantage of you. But over here is some of our kin. There's people that are related to us and they'll make sure they take care of you. So go to this field. And so she did. And when she went to the field, there was a man there that owned the field, and his name was Boaz. And Boaz noticed her. In fact, that's what it says. It says that, that when she went out in the field, like when he was watching and this, and this person came to do it, he said, hey, who is that? <laughs> um, I think a little bit, he kind of, it was like love at first sight, that he saw her and he thought, hey, she's beautiful, and, and, and I want to know more about her, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it kind of reminds me of, of uh, how I met my wife, that I w had been out of church as a young adult for a period of time in my life, and somebody invited me to come back to a church service. And, and the first thing I noticed when I got there was this girl got up to sing, and I said, hey, who is that? <laughs> and uh, three months later, I was married. So, so I think it's kind of one of these stories. Right in the middle between the time of the judges and the time of the kings, is a love story in the Bible where this guy Boaz, he ends up saying to his workers, he says, hey, leave her some extra food, <laughs> okay? Leave her some extra grain on the ground. And so they did. And so when she comes home, Naomi is like, hey, how did you get so much grain? And she's like, well, there's this guy there and he was really kind to me. And, and I think because Ruth had been through so much and she had lost her husband, she didn't really notice the signs that Boaz might be interested in her. So her mother-in-law is like, hey, man, I think he's kind of into you. So the next day when she goes back, they actually, her and Boaz kind of start dating. And you can read about how that is. It's, it's a pretty amazing thing. And, and it, had, it had a few awkward moments kind of thing, nothing weird, but just, but just it was kind of cool to see how that they got to know each other. And through the course of weeks, they started to fall in love with each other. It's an amazing story. 
And Ruth, for the first time, after losing so much, and some of us know how this feels, she had lost so much in her life that she started to love again. <laughs> and Boaz was an amazing man who was, who was patient and kind and, and had dignity and, and gave dignity to women and value. He was just a great man. And he came to her and he said, hey, I wanted you to know something. I am your kinsman. And it means that I could be your kinsman redeemer. They had kind of a, oh, uh, a, a rule in, in when, you're, when you're Jewish that went like this, that, that, hey, if you're a family member and you could marry somebody that was a relative that lost their spouse, then you should do that. And he said, I'm your kinsman redeemer. That's what that would mean. And it means that I could marry you and, and take care of you. And she's like, oh, yeah, I want to do that because she was in love with him. And then... He said, but here's the problem. There's another guy that's closer family member that, that he has the right to say if he wants to marry you first. And, and it's one of those things that I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that in your life where you, you thought, hey, you're, you have been so down for so long, and then there was a little bit of hope given to you, and now it's in turmoil. It doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It means that you have to wait and see how this thing kind of plays out. And she comes home frantic, and she comes home to Naomi, her mother-in-law, and she says, Naomi, this is, I just can't believe it. Boaz loves me, and we want to get married, and, and it's just not going to work out, and what do we do? And I want to show you what Naomi says. Naomi says this, then Naomi said to her, wait. <laughs> if you're able to take notes and you can circle this, I would recommend circling the word wait. She says, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. <laughs> Naomi is given some of the best advice. You see, in, in the first chapter, Ruth gave her mother-in-law some advice, and they became this bond where they said, hey, we're not going to blame, we're going to trust God. And they did. But now it's Naomi's turn, and she's pulling off of her wealth of knowledge. Some of us, as we get older, we've done that, right? We've rushed into things. And what she's saying is this, is she's saying, hey, if this man is serious about you, he's going to make this happen. And, and ladies, that's what I want to tell you. There's a lot of times when it comes to relationships that we try to force it. And I want to tell you, this is just kind of a side note, but it is so important that here's the thing. If you have to force it, God is not in it. Now, I don't mean there's not hard times. I don't mean that we don't strive and, and do. But here's the thing. If a person isn't trying to make it and you go, yeah, but I know that this isn't the right thing or I know this isn't the legal thing, but, right? What, what we're saying is, is not that it's a no. We're saying wait on God. In fact, that's what I want you to write down. Number two, what do you do when you are waiting on God's blessing? When God's blessing is right there and you feel like forcing it, and coming from Naomi, she's saying, don't try to force it. We did that. We went to Moab thinking that. And yes, we got you. And yes, we worked it out. But we lost so much. And we miss God's blessing. The place you want to be is not just physical prosperity, but the true blessing of God doing things God's way. What do you do? Don't rush. Instead, trust God. Don't rush. Don't try to rush God. By the way, you can't rush God. You'll mess it all up. In fact, in the, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, and I, and I got a verse for you, Isaiah 40 and verse 31, if you want to write it down, it says, but those who wait on the Lord, that's what it says in the King James. In the, in the new, uh, new International Version, it says this, it says, those that hope in the Lord, the meaning is the same, those that hope, meaning you're waiting on God's blessing, wait on the Lord. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strengths. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. <laughs> you want the strength of God? You know what you got to do? You've got to learn to wait. And that's what they did. <laughs> that's huge. So let me tell you how the story goes when you wait on the Lord. It goes like this. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when they, and she became his wife. So he had went to the other man, okay? And the other man said, hey, I know I'm the next in kin, but I have enough wives, and I can't take on anymore, so could you do this? <laughs> See how God works that out? And then he marries her, and it says that, he be that she became his wife. This is huge. And when he made love to her, <laughs> this is a love story, man. Don't, don't miss this part. It didn't just say, hey, he had sex with her. 
It says he loved her. It was not forced. It was romantic. They waited on God's timing, and it was a loving, pure relationship. Now, I want to say something here and say this. If you've messed up in your life like many of us have, then here's what I would like to say. That doesn't mean that God can't redeem the time. What I'm trying to tell you is, is wherever you're at, allow God to do a work in your life. And as you wait, enjoy the time that God is giving you. It's absolutely amazing. Let me, let me show you what else happens. The Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. And the woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who is this day has left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He has left you with a guardian redeemer. Let me, let me just say something here. The ladies that that Naomi was so worried about when she came back, you know, the judgmental people that she thought would be like, hey, you know, how does Ruth go? How does Ruth get here as a Moabite? That didn't exist. And I want to pause here to say, ladies, you have no idea the power that a group of ladies has. I I see it in church all the time. Church ladies. (laughs) That, that I grew up in a very traditional church, and, and they could do one or two things. They, they had chairs there. People had been there for several generations, and they had plaques on the chairs that said their family's name. And, and there was a choice there that said, hey, if you came into the church, they could be like, hey, what are you doing sitting in our seat? Because we've been here a long time, and that's for people that we know. Or they could kind of move down. Sometimes it was just body language. Ladies, I just want to tell you how much power there is. And in this moment, these ladies chose to encourage Naomi. Let me tell you what else happens. He will renew your life. This is what the ladies are saying to her. And sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and she cared for her, for him. (laughs) And the women there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. I'm going to pause there. Naomi has a son. You know what that means? Naomi's not related to her biologically. It's not important. Sometimes we put too much emphasis on that. You see, Naomi could have gotten stuck back there when we talked about blame. If she had gotten stuck in blame, you know what would have happened? When this moment came where she could have invested in the life of Ruth, who is not her biological child, she would have missed it. Because I've I've got stuck in grief. And I'm being careful how I say this, but some of us, we've had tremendous loss. And I know there's a grieving process, and we want to help you as much as we can. But one of the things I want to say is, don't let your grief keep you from loving other people and keep you from the purpose that God has. Because of this, she was able to have a grandson, even though it wasn't biological, from her daughter-in-law. Because these ladies made a pact, this day came. It's absolutely incredible. And everybody was celebrating with him. I want you you to see this last part, though. And they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. You may not realize how important this storyline is. But the great-grandmother of David, oh, by the way, David is the greatest king in the history of Israel. That's why I say it links the time of the judges to the time of the kings. It's found this story. And when everybody else got it wrong, Ruth and Naomi got it right. They placed their faith and trust in God. And you know what? God blessed them with the greatest king in the history of Israel that came from them. (laughs) The last thing I want to tell you is this, is be careful during the times of prosperity. The entire book of Judges is about people that when they were down and and it was hard times, they would call out to God. But when they got prosperous, they would turn against God. And the only people that didn't do that, and God blessed them amazingly, even during times of prosperity, was Ruth and Naomi. Can I tell you what to do? You're never more vulnerable than when you're on top, when God blesses your life. What do you do after God blesses you? Don't forget Instead, trust God. Don't forget. Instead, keep trusting in God. Don't, let you, don't trust in prosperity. Trust in God. It's so much more important because prosperity will come and go. I want to add one last piece to this story before we wrap up and pray today, and that's this. Why did Boaz marry Ruth, or, or one of the reasons why I think that he did? Why was he open to marrying a Moabite? Boaz was one of the most upstanding 
per- people in Israel. He was wealthy. He came from a prominent family, but he was willing to marry a Moabite. Now, first off, I want to tell you that, that, that being an Israelite wasn't just about being the actual physical descendant of Abraham. It had more to do with your faith than it did that. The reason why God said don't marry the ites was when they didn't place their faith and trust in God. But when they did, they could become Israelites. And Ruth became an Israelite that day. But why was he open to doing that? And I think part of it is, is from his own heritage. I think it came from his mother. So let me tell you a little bit about her story. When I told you that Joshua brought the children of Israel into the promised land, (laughs) there's a piece that I didn't say, and that is the first city they came to was Jericho. It's one of the most fortified cities, one of the most wicked cities that has ever existed in the history of mankind. And in that city was a prostitute. And when he had sent spies into the city to spy it out before they came in, that prostitute prayed to God and said, hey, I know the Israelites are coming, and I know they're going to destroy us. Would you save me? And he sent the spies to her, and she helped the spies escape from the city. And because of that, they allowed her to escape when they came in and destroyed the city of Jericho. Her name was Rahab. And Rahab married a man named Salmon, who was an incredible warrior in Israel. She, she didn't just get free and, and go back to a bad life. What happened to Rahab was this. She went from being a prostitute to being an Israelite, a chosen person of God, and she lived there. And Salmon and Rahab had a son, and his name was Boaz. <laughs> you see, Rahab was a Canaanite. And I believe that she instilled in her son, I think she said, let me tell you something, there has nobody been around like Rahab's been around. A prostitute in the most wicked city that's ever existed. Yet God could redeem her and make her one of his chosen people. And I think she told her son, don't ever judge a book by its cover. Don't ever judge a person by their past. It's not where you've been, it's where you're going. Now, it's very important that you're practicing those principles when you get together, not to be unequally yoked. But here's the thing. He's saying, hey, don't hold that against them. If God can change me, he can change anyone. And you know what? It led to one of the most incredible love stories in the Bible that produced an incredible family. (laughs) And in that line, you know who came? King David. That's what it says. I want to give you one other thing of where you find these two ladies at. It's in the book of Matthew. In the book of Matthew chapter 1, it, oftentimes we skip it when we're reading the Christmas story. But it talks about the, the line of Jesus, and it goes all the way from the time of Adam and Eve, and it, then it talks about how that Abraham was called and God used him, a man of faith. We find it again in Hebrews 11. It's one of the passages we've been covering. But in Matthew 1, it talks about the lineage of Jesus proving that he has the right to be Messiah. And it only mentions a few ladies here, but, but two of the ladies that it mentions in the line I want to show you today, it says this, Salmon, the father of Boaz. You recognize this story? Whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. I I didn't want that to get missed on you. In the very lineage of Christ, two ladies that were not Israelites by birth, but because they were forgiven by God and brought in, and it changed their life, and they got to choose to be an Israelite. They got to choose to worship God. Two ladies that were ites a Moabite and a Canaanite living in a Jewish world, yet God used them to raise up one of the most incredible families in the history of Israel, King David, who they said his, he will sit on the throne forever. And you know how he does that? Because at the very end, it says a virgin will give birth, and you will call his name Jesus. This is his lineage. And I think his lineage doesn't just say, hey, you have the right to be Messiah, but it shows why he came in the first place. That Jesus Christ himself is our kinsman redeemer, just like Boaz. I don't know where you find yourself at today. No matter where you come from or what you've done, we want you to know that God loves you. He sent his one and only son to die for you and to rise from the dead and offer you the right to come to where he's at. (laughs) I think if Rahab could be here today, she would say, you know what? I'm the great, great grandmother of King David. If God can use me, he can do it to anybody. If God can redeem me, he can redeem anybody. I think if Ruth were here today, she would say, if God could use me, he could use anybody. He could redeem anybody. (laughs) 
I want you to know that today. And the question I want you to end with today is this. What would you do if, you, if, a, if a person like you really trusted God? What would I do if a person like me really trusted God in the situation that I'm in? I hope you'll pray with me as I pray. Let, let's pray. Can I pray for you? Father God, we come before you today, and Lord, uh, this is an obscure story that is so powerful, and I'm so glad you included it. God, I'm praying today, Lord, for the one that is going through the hardest of times. God, I pray for the one that maybe, maybe they're feeling like they just need to blame. Maybe they've truly been hurt, and I pray, God, give them the ability to forgive today so that they can place their trust in you and that, God, you can take them to a different place, not full of regret and resentment, but freedom and purpose. God, I pray for the one that's in the course of waiting right now. That, Lord, they got this thing and they're going, I could do it in a not right way, but you're asking them to wait to see your power. I pray, God, give them the courage to wait and see what you can do. God, I pray for us that have been given more than anything we can believe. Sometimes we don't even realize how much we have until we see some of the places in the world where people are so hurt. I'm praying for us, God, that during times of prosperity, that instead of turning back to an old lifestyle, we'll take the example we saw here today and we'll trust in you. God, I pray for the one that doesn't even know you as Savior, that today is the day that they would place their faith and trust in you. They go, you know what? I don't know about this God, but, but if this is who he really is, and he would send his one and only son to die for me and rise from the dead. I might not understand all of it, but I'm going to call out to him in my own words. God, I pray, give him the courage to do that now. Let us all follow you and place our full trust in you. We'll give you all the honor and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen.